travel training that I'm gonna do. This summer I had the opportunity to go to Region 16 for two days and learn about different concepts in math and why it's so important to set that first foundation that starts in kinder and first grade. And so this training is usually a week training. We did it in two days and you guys are gonna do it in 45 minutes. So it's a lot of information. Um, I'm not an expert in this academy. I, you know, I just went for the two days, but I did learn a lot of useful information that I was able to start implementing in my classroom this year. So I hope that you can take something and then go back into your room and use it. If you have any questions after the training or throughout the rest of the year, um, you're welcome to come find me and I will gladly give you any other additional information. I do have the book here and I have lots of tabs with workstations, um, assessments. If you want to use any of it, you can come and use my binder and all, it's all labeled for you. So you would just go to the tab that you wanted. Um, I did get a lot of resources from the Academy, so um, I'm willing to share them with you. If you want to use any of them for a workstation, come find me. I will let you take whatever you need. Um, they were a free gift to me, and I would love to share them with you guys because they're good resources. Um, so let's begin so that we can finish quicker. So math outcomes. What you're going to be learning today is how to build knowledge and comprehension of effective and systematic instructional practices that support robust mathematic understanding. Um, you're also going to be learning how to explain learning process um, that develop a strong foundation for whole number operations based on place value concepts. Um, you're going to be able to identify critical checkpoints for understanding within the learning um, progress for whole number operations. Norms for the day. Um, one thing at the academy they stressed and we started every time we'd have a break, we'd come back, we'd start with our norms. Um, the next day we'd start with our norms, we would end with our norms. And they just really stressed on setting norms for your classroom, and then that makes the students accountable for their learning. So some of the norms that um, we had, this is just an example. So no cell phones or grading papers during our meeting. Treat others with respect. We're gonna start and end on time. Um, we will share information and collaborate without being competitive. We will come prepared to our meeting. So have your calendar, writing utensils. Take risks and remember to celebrate things that you learn. So in a classroom, you can change it according to the grade that you're teaching. Come to carpet, no, don't bring anything on carpet with you, be ready to learn, sit like a good listener, whatever expectations you have in your classroom. Some norms for mathematics. Um, listen to what others are saying. You might learn for, from them. Um, be respectful of others' answers. Try your best and participate. Everyone makes mistakes. And again, be sure to stress, celebrate the little things. Okay, so what are whole number concepts? So um, I just wrote a little definition of what we learned. Um, it's a learning progression. Um, it's sequenced in a set of sub-skills and embodies of enabling knowledge that is believed students must master en route to mastering a more remote curricular, curricular aim. In other words, it's composed of step-by-step -step building blocks that students are presumed to need in order to successfully attain um, a designated instructional outcome. So we're gonna do a little activity. If you could just, if you have any cell phones, if you'll put them away at this time, please. Um, just clear your area for this sheet of paper that I'm gonna give you. Okay, if you have a pen, you can use your pen if you wanna use one of my pencils. <laughs> okay, so what you're going to do is I want you to draw a big rectangle like a phone, a shape of a phone on your paper. Okay, for the next part of the activity, you are going to have, I'll time you on my phone because I don't, oh, actually I'll time you on that. When I say start, you're gonna have one minute and I want you to draw all the apps that you have on your phone in the order in the spot that they are on your phone. Gosh. Okay, <laughs> Let me, let's wait till it turns to the seven and then I'm gonna give you one minute to get that done. So the exact spot of your phone, if you have the little square with the apps in the square or however you have your phone set up. Go ahead, begin. Now 
have to be fancy. Remember, you only have one minute. Can we just write the word? We're not drawing yes. pictures. Right? Okay. Yes. and then they can move them back and forth and do it just like a rec and rec. So this was something that we got to do at our academy. And then another one, um, when you're teaching number concept, you can make a bead for everyone in your class. And there's tw uh, 100 on here. And you can um, call out a number, so say you 10, and the kids will know automatically to move 10 and show you. And do it like a speed competition. So you can pull out any number, and, and once they get used to using these, they should be able to do it really quick. So this was another idea, if you want to use that, um, you're welcome to, but this is one of the activities, and then, um, like I said, the instructions are in the box. I did easy ones, and then I did harder ones for first grade, your, you know, for your kids, or if you have lower kids that are doing the RTI for math, you can use some of these activities and do them at your desk with them if you wanted to. So there's, there's different levels, so I made sure to differentiate for you guys. Okay, so go ahead and begin. You want us to do one at a time, right? Y'all can do it however. If you want to grab a tub and do it on your own and then oh, rotate okay. the tub, you can do that. This all goes together. So this yeah. And this is just identifying. Okay. Yeah, each child would have one of those, and then you could just get out your beads really fast and do like a little five minutes after your class. I don't, we just made one, but they recommended that we made it to buy this stuff. Yeah, I bet you she would. Yeah. I bet you that she would. Yeah. And I have a big class one if you ever want to use it too, that you can use for your whole class and it's And the cards for this one are down here at the bottom. And it so this would be a good RTI one. Oh, this is just individual ones? Mm -hmm. Those are the those are the activity cards that you would do. The directions are right here. Would you want it to be these like laminated so that way you Yeah. Right? Yes, you'd want them laminated, but I just printed them out just to show no, you guys. No, no, but, um, and like I said, any of this that you want, I have in the book and you can make copies of there's tons of workstations in there. Helps with that. So, yeah. 
And that is that is good for an assessment too, to see if they don't care. And these are individual ones, so if you want to grab one, mm -hmm. and then the directions are right there to each one. Look at this. Yeah, the buildings and the rolls of the dice. Those dice are great. Do you have a problem with these keys, Sam? Um, I haven't yet, but I've only used them in my groups. So I have the other ones that are easier to stamp on the old. The well, ones. it's not that I like stamping ones. It's that they want to build. They want to build oh, guns and. I just go over my expectations. Yeah. Really, really good with them, and I watch them. And do I it. find them like playing with them more, and then I use. That's why I use the old tiny ones, the ones that were you were talking about, because mm -hmm. they can't build on. To See, the only thing I would do different on these is always write the treasure on the back. Oh, for them to see. So that it's not just I'm doing that and that's going to be right. Like, there's no check for them to go, oh, yeah, it is mm -hmm. the right one. Mm -hmm. That's the only thing I did. And it's not because I want them to cheat. And maybe I can make copies of these. Of these. I, we haven't gotten yeah. to this yet in our class. So I can make copies of this, exactly. cut them, and laminate them, and then mm -hmm. they can do a self check. Self check like that, mm -hmm. yeah. Because the answers are on here. Because you, I mean, what is the saying? It takes one time to do it. Yeah, I'm not having any answers. Yes. So what you're saying? Yeah. <laughs> so these answers are on. Yeah, the answers are on here. So um, okay. I guess what? Yeah, what I'll do. So is what she said, you can write them on the back. Yeah. yeah, or I'll just make copies of this and laminate them, and mm -hmm. then they can check it when they're done with their activity. This could even be something if um, you could use, like when you're doing a bathroom break in the mm -hmm. hall, and you're they're waiting for yes. for everybody to finish. Mm -hmm. Because something you could check with them. Yeah, that would be really good. Because they struggle with this. What is one mm -hmm. more? What are you know, oh, yes. two more? With, cause especially in IXL, I find these are great though. Mm -hmm. Well, you're supposed to, yeah, right, put those around your room so they can actually walk it's around and right around the room. Mm -hmm. I so if you're only up to 10, then you just put those out. Yes. Yes, and I only, I did, I didn't differentiate this one like I did my other one. But yeah, I made it higher ones for the first graders so that when they come to this activity. But yeah, I would just take out one through five first, and then five through 10, and then one through 10, and then one through 15. Just, I would do it like that. So since you just differentiated for the higher kids, do you like stop and then whenever it's their turn, you put in or you put build it material for them? You can already have it written. So you, do you tell the other kids, don't get this one. This is really Well, you can just keep it. Yeah, I would probably, um, when I see my high group going to that one, I would just tell them, you guys do this one, this set instead. So, but if they're around the room, they'll already be around the room. And, with the activity, they have to go to the, the number that they have. So the yellow, what is it? Answer to yellow. all yellow. Yes, and the directions are right here yeah. to the whole activity. Yeah. So we would need to separate okay, these to green to be yellow. So you would yes. have three sets in the same thing. And you could send it on cardstock to get printed that, mm -hmm. that color and then laminate them. Yeah. And there's a bunch of, I mean, there's the different ways. The, Tin frame, the tallies, and the wood with us. Oh, and then I had the. This one I didn't have the boards. Okay, never mind. I thought I had the boards the next one. And then you just erase them. Yep. That works. And if you need any of these. And I like it because it's going to teach them to write their numbers even. Mm -hmm. I mean, they can learn how to write one through one through two. Did you already try this one? No. Yeah.
when I can't get into the beer wrap, this will be on Sunday. Yeah. I want, I'm going to make copies of that right. and then laminate them. I think what I'm going to do is when they start going to go, I'm just going to give it to the packer. So this will be a little bit better. Okay, if you'll just put it back in the container, and if y'all want to just come to this table over here, and the table will come to you guys. So, Lord, and Alice, if you'll come over here, then I'll give y'all five more minutes to work on that one station. Rolling, so let's say they keep rolling a four and all their fours are filled, they just have to keep rolling till they get a yeah, number. No, that's mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, and this keeps them busy the whole workstation. That's good. Time. Yeah. one is I introduced it at my small table and I'm really I set my expectations and I'm sure that if I see the minute I see them playing around right. with the dice or right. the cubes to correct the behavior right. and so then I'll watch them the whole time and once yeah. they do it with me a couple times then I'll put it out on the how do you introduce like every just addition? like you're they're playing it with you yeah. mm -hmm. If it's an easy one like Play-Doh, I'll mm -hmm. do a whole class. But if it's a hard one like this, I do it on my table. Yeah. Well, during what time? During um, like math, math workstations work on Fridays mm -hmm. or RTI time. Mm -hmm. oh, okay. We do math RTI. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's good. You bought these? I bought them at my workshop. Really? The whole class set. If you want to borrow some for a workstation, yeah. you can borrow some. And, and then the little um, cards to that one are on the bottom. Okay. And then there's directions. Those are just, this is just the directions on how okay. to do the, the activities. There's more than one. Yeah. So you can look at this. I like this one for assessing the kids. Like right. One on one over mm -hmm. here. Oh, to yeah. see if they understand it. Yeah. Rather than putting this one in a workstation, I right. would do it as an individual. Yeah. But really setting that foundation that they know that one color is five, the other is five. So that way it'll be a really fast eight and yeah. they'll right away. Or you can, they can do it, the way we learned at our training is they can either use just the top row or if you want to do eight, you can do it that way. Three. So teaching them, and this is just really quick for them to get their, their numbers. So 15, then they would know. And then they, they always have to start in the same position. So after you're done doing a number, have them put them back, and then you say 18. Well, they're going to be able to do it really fast because they know that that's 15, and they just need to add three. Mm -hmm. we did a, well, we did a bracelet just for the pack mm -hmm. that had 10 beads, and they would have to show us. And it was like a bracelet they kept in their art boxes several mm -hmm. years back. They're not the same. But they're different. I picked them up from whenever they were throwing stuff away. I need to check to see. Because I don't think they're the ones that are just coming up. Yeah, the there's ones. some. That, yeah, these are just the newer ones. But yeah, they used right. to be like a. Yeah, there's like a. Yeah. I've had the ones in school. 
Yeah, yeah they used to be called Abacus. Yes. Abacus, and then yes. they changed it to yeah. Rick and Rick. Mm -hmm. Teachers, pardon the interruption. If uh, any of you need anything from Walmart, if you need to come, let me know today. Thank you. I can send them to you. The ones that were printed out, or then there are some of them that are from the book. Okay, so the next part of our presentation is going to be on subitizing. Has anyone ever heard of subitizing? Okay, so this is apparently a really big thing right now, and um, everyone at the Math Academy knew this, except I think I was the only one at my table that did not have a clue what subitizing was. But it's something that you already do, you just don't know that that's what it's called. So subitizing is instantly seeing how many. It's the foundation to the development of number sets. What is subitizing? Subitizing is not a term that we often use, but it is an important mathematical concept that can greatly benefit student achievement. Subitizing is the ability to instantly see how many. This method of teaching is achieved when students can spontaneously recognize and discriminate small numbers of objects. Students who can subitize are able to see, to able to just know a group of numbers and recognize the pattern. Um, we move students from one by one counting to subitizing. So how do you teach subitizing? We teach subitizing by exposing students to number patterns they can immediately recognize. We train their brains to see organized groups of numbers. When students can successfully subitize, they are able to mentally compose, which means bring together and decompose break apart numbers. They are able to quickly add numbers together without counting one to one. So here's an example of subitizing composing numbers. Students understand that a full 10 frame equals 10 and a half 10 frame equals five. So together students can compose five, 10 plus five equals 15 visually. Decomposing, um, the problem is 12 minus five. Students subitize and know what two plus three equals five. When they visually and or mentally subtract, they are left with seven. So just teaching them to take the five away from what the 10 frames and then just do the seven. Okay, so let's practice subitizing. So I have a little, I love Jack Hartman. So I have a little Jack Hartman video on subitizing that you can, when you first introduce the concept to your class, maybe do it every day before math starts and then maybe do it once a week and then maybe once a month just to refresh their brain on what it is. So I have a little video here.
and Ms. Velasco, can you come to the office? four pieces around it and then this one's going to be like a long number line yeah. which one this one, this one yes. oh so like I so would, there's not a match no I would oh. what I would have them do is do this one on the floor okay I was thinking there was going to be and a match I've only I introduced this one to my students I have okay okay so it would be like that mm -hmm. and then just keep building from there yeah okay sorry <laughs> you're okay I was like well I thought maybe there was A match or something. Which I'm already teaching them with this one how to use our number line up there to look for the words. So they're starting to recognize what one looks like, what two looks like, what three. Because on this one they have to write the word. I mean, they have to find the spelled word for the number. Yeah. This one is just um, the part part composing holes. numbers, yeah. Part part holes. Oh, so cool. And then I have the so you just give them that so they can make the part part holes. to use them to make the numbers on top right. and then the C number they right. can use that too. Yep. Sounds good. What do you do? At my training. Uh, they stick on my board. I use them a lot when I'm teaching. I saw that. I was like, do you, you didn't have those with you? No. I have some magnetic ones I use for. But did you use that thing with that thing still like the thing? Did you use the box and the whole thing? They gave me two of those. I was like, everybody needs to get one of these to go. No, we got two of those. Oh, wow. That's two good things. It was definitely a good training. If y'all can sign up for it, and y'all are aware of it. It's Math Academy. And they have a reading academy. I want to try to find it. I've done a reading academy. The first one I went to was last summer. And it was reading. This one was a private last summer. I went to Dr. Jean. Mm -hmm. I thought the same thing. It just depends on who you get to come speak. And then they have a lot of teachers who need to go to breakout sessions. And it's kind of a lot of sorting. It, well, yeah, and I taught my kids when they started put all the words together, yeah. all the tin frames together. And that's all the that one. Yeah. yeah. So I had them do that one. Do you want to try this one, Justin? Oh, that one's still there. They really like this one a lot. I think when I 
introduce this one. I only had the one through five with Kim, yeah. okay. and I only did one through five. So then I might teach them um, six through ten, and then maybe even separate it. When they haven't done it at their, on their own, they've just done it with me. Mm -hmm. okay. Separate and have like maybe this one be one through five, so that way they'll have enough time to finish mm -hmm. it. I mean, like double stacks, like one and oh. one, two and two, three and three. No, I didn't know if they came with them. There's just like one more. Okay, okay. which is what they they need that too. We have doubles coming up. That's why I was asking. Oh. And this one is doubles. decomposing <laughs> numbers, and I differentiate it one through ten, and then we let twenty.
finding the missing part. Oh. And so Good. you did do your gotcha. Oh. And that was 11 through 20. I can show you on the box in a little bit that they came in and maybe there might be a website on the box. with that.
you have believed about your own potential has changed what you have learned and continues to do that, continues to change your learning and your experiences. So how many people here, let's get a show of hands, have ever been given the idea that they're not a math person or that they can't go on to the next level of math, they haven't got the brains for it? Let's see a show of hands. So quite a few of us. And I'm here to tell you that idea is completely wrong. It is disproven by the brain science, but it is fueled by a single myth that's out there in, in our society that's very strong and very dangerous. And the myth is that there's such a thing as a math brain, that you're born with one or you're not. We don't believe this about other subjects. We don't think we're born with a history brain or a physics brain. We think you have to learn those, but with math, people, students believe it, teachers believe it, parents believe it. And until we change that single myth, we will continue to have widespread underachievement in this country. Carol Dweck's research on mindset has shown us that if you believe in your unlimited potential, you will achieve at higher levels in maths and in life. And an incredible study on mistakes showed this very strongly. So Jason Moser and his colleagues actually found from MRI scans that your brain grows when you make a mistake in maths. Fantastic. When you make a mistake, synapses fire in the brain. And in fact, in their MRI scans, they found that when people made a mistake, synapses fired. When they got work correct, less synapses fired. So making mistakes is really good. And we want students to know this, but they found something else that was pretty incredible. This image shows you the voltage maps of people's brains. And what you can see here is that people with a growth mindset who believed that they had unlimited potential, they could learn anything, when they made a mistake, their brains grew more than the people who didn't believe that they could learn anything. So this shows us something that brain scientists have known for a long time, that our cognition and what we learn is linked to our beliefs and to our feelings. And this is important for all of us, not just kids in math classrooms. If you go into a difficult situation or a challenging situation and you think to yourself, I can do this, I'm gonna do it, and you mess up or fail, your brain will grow and more and react differently than if you go into that situation thinking, I don't think I can do this. So it's really important that we change the messages kids get in classrooms. We know that anybody can grow their brain and brains are so plastic to learn any level of maths. We have to get this out to kids. We ha they have to know that mistakes are really good. But maths classrooms have to change in a lot of ways. It's not just about changing messages for kids. We have to fundamentally change what happens in classrooms. And we want kids to have a growth mindset, to believe that they can grow and learn anything. But it's very difficult to have a growth mindset in maths if you're constantly given short, closed questions that you get right or wrong. Those questions themselves transmit fixed messages about math that you can do it or you can't. So we have to open up maths questions so that there's space inside them for learning. And I want to give you an example now. We're actually going to ask you to think about some maths with me. So this is a fairly typical problem that's given out in schools, and I want you to think about it a bit differently. So we have three cases of squares. And in case two, there's more squares than in case one, and in case three, there's even more. And often this is given out with the question, how many squares would there be in case 100 or case n? But I want you to think of a different question now. I want you to think without any numbers at all or without any algebra. I want you to think entirely visually. And I want you to think about where do you see the extra squares? If there are more squares in case two than case one, where are they? So if you're in a classroom, I'll give you a long time to think about this, but... Um, in the uh, interest of time, I'm going to show you some different ways people think about this. And I've given this problem to many different people. And it was, I think it was my undergrads at Stanford who said to me, or well, one of them said to me, oh, it's, I see it like raindrops, where raindrops come down on the top. So it's like an outer layer that grows new each time. It was also my undergrads who said, oh, no, I see it more like a bowling alley you get an extra row, like a row of skittles that comes in at the bottom. Very different way of seeing the growth. 
It was a teacher, I remember, who said to me, it was like a volcano. The center goes up, and then the lava comes out. <laughs> it was another teacher who said, oh, no, it's like the party at the Red Sea. The shape separates, and there's a duplication with an extra center. And I remember this uh, was, uh, oh, no, sorry, not this one as well. Some people see it as triangles. They see the outside growing as an outside triangle. And then there was a teacher in New Mexico who said to me, oh, it's like Wayne's World. Stairway to heaven, access denied. <laughs> way of seeing it. If you move the squares, which you always can, and you rearrange the shape of it, you'll see that it actually grows as squares. So this is what I want to illustrate with this question. When it's given out in maths classrooms, and this isn't the worst of questions, uh, it's given out with the question of how many. And kids count. So they'll say in the first case there's four, in the second there's nine. They might stare at that column of numbers for a long time and say, if you add one to the case number each time and square it, then you get the total number of squares. But when I give it, we give it to teach, uh, students and teachers, high school teachers, and I'll say to them when they've done this, so why is that squared, do you think? Why do you see that squared function? They'll say, hmm, no idea. So this is why it's squared. The function grows as a square. You see that squaring in the algebraic representation. So when we give these problems to students, we give them the visual question, we ask them to how they see it, they have these rich discussions, and they also reach deeper understandings about a really important part of mathematics. So we actually need a revolution in maths classrooms. We need to change a lot of things. And part of the reason we need to change so much is because research on maths teaching and learning is not getting into schools and classrooms. And I'm gonna give you a stunning example now. So this, um, is really interesting. When we calculate, even when adults calculate, where a brain area that sees fingers is lighting up. We're not using fingers, but that brain area that sees fingers lights up. So there's a brain area when we use fingers and there's a brain area when we see fingers. And it turns out that seeing fingers is really important for the brain. And in fact, finger perception is, um, the scientists test for finger perception by asking people to put their hands under a table, no, they can't see them, touching a finger, and then seeing if you know which finger has been touched. The amount that university students have good finger perception predicts their calculation scores. And the amount of finger perception grade one students have is a better prediction of maths achievement in grade two than test scores. It is that important. But what happens in schools and classrooms Students are told they're not allowed to use their fingers. They're told it's babyish. They're made to feel bad about it. When we stop children learning number through fingers, it's akin to halting their numerical development. And scientists have known this for a long time. And the neuroscientists conclude that fingers should be used for students learning number and arithmetic. If we haven't published this, we published this in a paper in The Atlantic last week. I don't know any educator who knew this. This is causing a huge ripple through the education community. So I want to, um, there's lots of other research that's not known by teachers in schools. We also know that when you perform a calculation, the brain is involved in a complex and dynamic communication between different areas of the brain, and including the visual cortex. Yet maths classrooms are not visual, they're numerical and abstract. So I want to show you now what happened when we brought 81 students onto campus last summer and we taught them differently. So we taught them about the brain growing, we taught them about mindset and mistakes, and we, but we also taught them creative, visual, beautiful maths. And uh, they came in for 18 lessons with us. Before they came to us, they'd taken a district standardized test. We gave them the same test at the end of our 18 lessons and they improved by an average of 50%. They all, 81 students from a range of achievement levels told us on the first day, I'm not a math person. They could name the one person in their class who was a math person. We changed their beliefs. And this is a clip from a longer music video that we made um, of the kids. Shake, 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 shake it off, shake it off, I'm not 
research out to teachers. We need a revolution in maths teaching. And if you don't believe me, come listen to this kid. He's a middle schooler, and we had worked with his teachers to shift from worksheet math to open math with mindset messages. Um, this is him reflecting on that shift. Math class last year was notes and just handouts, and you were your own, your own little box. You were just boxed in. You were like by yourself. It was every man for themselves. But now this year, it's just open. We're a whole big, like, it's like a, a city. We're all working together to create this new beautiful world. I think the challenges and like the future that lies ahead of for me, like, like oh, if I if I keep on pushing, if I keep on doing this someday, I'm gonna make it. We have focused for so long in education, in maths education, on the right way to teach a fraction, on the standards we use in classrooms, which are argued about all the time. And we've completely ignored the belief students hold about their own potential. And only now is the full extent of the need to attend to that coming to light. We all have to believe in ourselves to unlock our unlimited potential. Thank you. Okay, so what did y'all think about the video? I thought it was good. Mm -hmm. I thought it was good too, and I know I'm guilty of one that's saying, let's not use our fingers, let's figure it out another way. And it's so important that in those beginning grades that we do let them explore and let them use their fingers, that'd be fun, let them make mistakes. So I know one thing that I do in my classroom a lot of times is when we're doing math together, um, and I call a student to come up to the board and and solve the problem, I don't just have them solve the problem, then they have to tell the class why. Why did you put 10 counters in the 10 frame? And they have to be able to tell us because there was 10 frogs, so each counter is one of the frogs, and they already know it, like now it, I don't even have to tell them to explain why, they know to do it and then to start telling the class why they did what they did. So just putting them in charge of their learning, and we hear so many times that kids learn better from each other. So giving them that opportunity, even though it does take longer, your lesson does take longer, but they really understand it. So I hope y'all enjoyed this little training that we did and you got something out of it that you'll be able to use in your classrooms. And like I said, I'm here if y'all have any questions or if y'all need any of my resources, I will gladly give them to you.